Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful weekend and, uh, again, didn't get the people that are in the nice parts of the, or with the, uh, received nice weather, had a good weekend, the people that had uh, bad weather that you survived the weekend. So hopefully uh, uh, all is well, and we'll jump off into the uh, the call today with, with Ben from ECA. He's our uh, life insurance expert and underwriter expert, so he's going to kind of let us know what's going on with the life industry and touch on the DOL a little bit. Hi, everybody. Uh, um just got a couple updates on carriers and then some industry things and the underwriting piece and then just to wrap up with a, a quick note on the Department of Labor fiduciary rule. Um, carrier wise, um, a few carriers are still a little behind uh, but we have seen improvement in, in some of the carriers we work with, particularly American General and Protective. Um, carriers that have been uh, normally really good to work with, banners slowed down a little bit and uh, uh, but they're still still in, in, a, in a good range. So there's no carriers that are completely buried anymore where it's taking three weeks to get answers. Uh, they're all back within within that week to 10 days, even if, if they're a little behind. So um, the big the big uh, backlogs that the carriers have been uh, taken care of. Um, I think the biggest change over the last couple months is uh, Genworth closing shop. So uh, the Genworth is out of the life and annuity space. Uh, we're just wrapping up the, the tail end of the last, the last pieces of business that were submitted there. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about that, uh, contact me offline or uh, after the call and if you have any cases pending that uh, you need to talk about. Uh, but we're just wrapping up the tail end of business there and over the next 30 to 60 days that should all be shut down uh, as far as new business. They're still servicing things, but on that end, um, I've had to help with a couple service issues there. And it's taken several calls to even get to a, a live person sometimes. So if you're running any service issues on any Genworth business you have, um, feel free to contact me and I can try and help navigate that for you. Um, so that's the, one of the biggest updates. A um, little information on just some underwriting topics. The last, the last couple months I've seen a lot of cases come in, probably three or four a week, uh, dealing with foreign nationals or foreign travel or uh, clients that have foreign travel and they're literally working overseas for six, nine, eleven months of the year um, or residing in another country for the foreseeable future. And if you have those cases, it, on those it's always best to do a quick quote. I can send that out to 15, 16 different companies or narrow it down if you're looking just for, for an IUL or just for an LTC writer company. Um, but I, if you contact me ahead of time on those, I'll give you the questions to ask. Or if you can get enough information up front, I'll let you know well, if we can get these other couple pieces of information, it'll help get the best offer for them. Um, we've had a couple where there's literally only one company or two companies that have uh, been willing to offer, um, but we've been able to get some people coverage that they thought they were uninsurable because they've been declined at several companies. So if you get if you run into those kind of tricky situation, whether they're foreign nationals or they're U.S. citizens, foreign you know, traveling abroad or living abroad or working abroad, um, just send those my way, and I can uh, help get some offers. Um, the other thing that kind of goes along with that sometimes is uh, aviation or scuba diving. So if they have those histories, that can be included along with the quotes, and then we can get the right the right ballpark uh, range up front um, and get those answers for you. Um, and for example, there's a, one case we had a guy who lived in Saudi Arabia on a, in an oil compound, an oil company compound, for 11 months of the year. We had one company that was willing to take that. Uh, it was Mutual of Omaha. Um, another one, they had uh, some other foreign travel where they're diving off platforms in um, two different locations, and there were two companies that were able to offer on that at standard rates. So uh, there, there can really be some some good outcomes on, on cases like that where you think there might not be any options. Now the last thing, just some industry updates. Uh, the AG49 really hasn't become much of a, a challenge or an obstacle on any business. There's been some, the carriers have for the most part made all their illustration changes. Um, what we see a little bit more of now is requests for new illustrations prior to issue or delivery. And that's if uh, the original one was submitted prior to the rule being implemented, and now we're at the point where uh, we're ready to issue. Sometimes, depending on how the carriers interpreted the rule, they need a new illustration prior to issue or delivery. Um, but really, for the for that that AG49 um, uh, rule that changed the illustration rates, 
and how the uh, how the uh, the interest rates are illustrated. Uh, that's been really a non-issue as far as as far as business goes, and that's what we're hoping also for the the, the most recent news, the Department of Labor fiduciary rule. Um, carriers are going to be updating their forms over the next year. Um, so right now it's really business as usual. Um, it'll change some things, but it, really it'll be you know, a lot of the forms and, and things like that that we'll need are going to be updated by each carrier, and it should be should be fine by that time. And who knows? Maybe some of the the legal challenges will stand up. Um, there could be some other changes or carve outs or or modifications to the rule. So the the couple calls I've been on to explain it have really just said it's they're just going through the going through the process now. And um, really, for the next year, there's there's really no change. Um, and as as it uh, proceeds, the carriers are going to update everything that's needed as far as disclosures and things like that. So. Uh, in the end, it's it's probably not as big of a deal as it's uh, made out to be, and hopefully we'll have some some good outcomes on that rule as well. That's all I had for updates. If anybody has any questions, I can take them now. Thanks, Ben. Uh, let's see here. Nobody is uh, opting in, but we're so lucky to have uh, uh, the resource of Ben on the phone here once once a month, and we really appreciate you taking the time, Ben. All right. Thank you. Have a good Thanks. day. Thanks. So again, guys, just the update on the on the DUL um, as it stands, and now that people have had a better chance to look at it, it's essentially what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to um, fill out additional paperwork. I know we all hate additional paperwork, and you have to let people know what your compensation is right prior to the uh, uh, selling of the product. Um, but that's not a big deal. We were doing that a lot in the early 2000s. Uh, when NAFTA first came on and had their big push for that. So that's the worst that could possibly happen, but there's lots of things that can uh, make it even better and reduce that paperwork problem here um, over the next year or so. But um, all is well on that side. So uh, why do you think I have this cartoon up? What do you think this cartoon is symbolizing? Uh, Craig, you got it. Non-engagement. No one paying attention, Steve. Exactly. Lack of attention. So when we hear a yes, could any of these people, if he, if he, if this guy called on any of these people uh, <laughs> and said, so do you understand this, what would they all say? Yes. So what does a yes mean? Diddly do. And so that's why we ask open-ended questions. Does it take longer? Yes, it does take longer. So why, why do we do it? Why do we do it the motivational interviewing way, the asking questions way? Why do I go no more than uh, 15 seconds before I ask another question? To make sure that they are following along and make sure that they agree with everything that I'm saying. Because will anybody say anything that they don't, they'll say yes to something they don't agree with. Well, actually, will they explain uh, why they agree with something they don't agree with? Will anybody explain why they agree with something they don't agree with? You know how I know they won't? Because how much do I have to work with you guys and beat you about the head and shoulders and scream at you and listen to tapes and, and, re, and, and, and re, uh, review it and review it review it to get you guys to say things that you don't believe? So if I have to do that with you and, I, and you're physically trying to do this, what do we know about a client saying something they don't believe? I want everybody to get answer this. We got we got uh, 100 people on the phone here. I want everybody to. So we got two. Come on, guys. Yeah, they won't do. That's right. Won't happen. So that's that's why we ask questions. I know it takes longer, but uh, <laughs> what I found is, are shortcuts ever shortcuts, guys? Shortcuts are never shortcuts. They're always long cuts. So what is the number one problem? You know, when we have guys come on the system, um, do you think, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's the guy, who do you, who do you think ends up having a, a bigger um, uh, first year? A guy who's already moderately successful where he's writing maybe $3 million in a um, in new annuity business on a yearly basis, or say a Medicare sub guy who only wrote 500000 
over the last year? Which guy do you think is more successful that first year? Everybody's saying the Medicare sub guy. Why? You're right. He is. Why is it? Why does he go from 500,000 to 5 million, where the $300,000 guy goes from $300,000 to 4 million? I'm sorry, from 3 million to 4 million. Because if you think about it, he the, the Medicare sub guy has a much bigger learning curve, doesn't he? He's got to learn more about annuities. He's got to learn more about financial advice. He's got to learn more about all sorts of things. So why does he actually not? He he actually surpasses. Remember, I'm saying he went from 500,000 to 5 million, where the 3 million dollar guy only went from 3 to 4 million. So not only did the the the, did the Medicare sub guy have a bigger percentage wise, but he actually is now making more than that successful guy. Why? Well, see, they all have, you know, the Medicare sub guy had just as many bad habits as the uh, successful guy. He had just as many bad habits as the successful guy. Nope, he, he didn't have any more to unlearn. So what has nothing to do with bad habits, has nothing to do with unlearning. They're both salespeople. They were both salespeople when they came on. They were both learned to sell, sell, sell when they came on. So it has nothing to do about learning <laughs> or unlearning or whatever. It has to do with this. The guy who's writing, who wrote three million last year, guess what he tells me? He never learns the system. Why doesn't he learn the system? Because every time I ask him whether he's, that's right, Steve, he's too busy. Too busy, too busy, too busy. He's too busy making three or writing three million to learn to write eight, ten million. Because that, that guy who's writing three million has much less steep learning curve than the Medicare sub guy. That guy writing three million should be writing ten. And, and Je Jeff Freeber, could you jump in, in here on this? A guy who comes in here moderately successful, sh how much more should he have a leap that first year than somebody who's re really learning the whole industry? I guess Jeff is wandering around the, the uh, hey Hey, Jeff, you're, office. there you go. Jeff, you're muted. There you go. Oh, go okay. for it now. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, the guy, who's, uh, the, the guy who's established should have a head start. He really should, you know, hit the ground running because he doesn't have to learn a lot of the things. Like Mike said, the guy with Medicare SEPs doesn't know a lot about annuities. He has to learn about annuities. The guy that has the established practice already... He knows the paperwork, he knows the carriers, he knows the talk, he knows all about the product, he knows how to present them. He really should have a head start. And so the reason they tell me is that they're so busy running their business that they don't have time to improve their business. So what, what's our solution for that, guys? I, I rolled it out here about three months ago. What's our solution for that? Yeah, not the 15 minutes. Nope, not the 15 minutes. So that does help. That does help. Because you can't learn the scripts in 15 minutes. 15 minutes is, that's right. John got it. Jason got it. The 21 light. So if your business, if you're so busy running your business, what you need to do is what? Clear out your calendar. Get rid of all of the, of the, um, client servicing. So get all your client servicing done in a month. Because if you get all your client servicing done in a month, and you'll see why I'm bringing this up here in a second. If you get all your client servicing done this month, what will that do for summer? If you see all of your clients in the next month, what will that do for your entire summer? Free it up. Because, if, you know, I tell you what, when I saw my clients for, for an annual review, when did they want to see me again? Next month? If I saw my clients for my interview, when they want to say, a year, that's right, Jonathan. So, and so it freed me up for a year. Because there's nothing more frustrating than when a guy tells me this. I say, why have you made no, no improvement? Why have you made no progress over the last two weeks? And guess what they say? Oh, I've been so busy, so busy, so busy. Yeah, here's what their calendar looks like. Yeah, 9 a.m., I'm doing something. 10 a.m., I'm going someplace. Noon, I'm meeting someone. 1 p.m., I'm working, working, working. What are you working on? Well, you know, just stuff. More meetings, busy, busy, busy. Guys, what? <laughs> look at this calendar. What happened during this whole week? Because you tell me, you know, it's hilarious. Because here's the funny thing. I run 32 to 42 coaching appointments a week, plus write two coaching calls, plus write 
uh, all sorts of um, uh, newsletters and things like that. So if anybody's busy, and, and it, it cracks me up because with when when um, <laughs> my wife and I are working with with her mother, and um, so she's uh, 70, uh, 76 years old, and and my wife will ask her to do one thing during the week, and guess what she says when she asks her, "Do you get that phone call done?" What is what does her mother say? Ah, it's too busy. Ah, it's too busy. Too busy. So what do you think a 78-year-old or a 76-year-old doing all week? It's, no, it's what? Is she really that busy? And are you guys really that busy? Here's a determination to determine whether you're too, too busy. If you look at your calendar at the end of the day and you are doing something that didn't make you more money, save you time, or make your business life easier, guess what that day was full of? Nothing. That's right, Steve. Nothing. A waste. What's it, what's answering emails? What's that worth? Now I'll give you I'll give you just one example. So I was talking to a guy. And I was asking him, "Why are you not doing these things? Why are you?" And he's busy, busy, busy. I'm busy. I said, "Really doing what?" He goes, "Servicing my clients." I said, "Give me an example of what you're doing servicing your clients." He goes, "For example, I have this business that I'm working with, and they had me busy all last week." I said, "How much do you get paid on that business?" Guess what he told me. So he was busy all last week working on that business. Guess what he told me? He got paid per year on that business. 500 bucks for the year. So guys, if you're getting paid $500 a year to service a business, what would you tell that business? <laughs> I'm getting a lot of answers. Exactly. So the, the fact is, if you want to get better, what do you need to do? You need to work at it. Stop See, it. here's the thing. With, with, um, well, I've, I've told you this story before. When I wanted to learn Spanish, I really wanted to learn Spanish. So I got Rosetta Stone, and I, and I spent um, an hour a day, religiously, for a whole year. So that's 365 hours. For a whole year. Every single day, I spent an hour. And how much Spanish do you know at the end of the hour? At the end of the hour. At the end of the year. I could recognize a lot of words. Could I put any, could I st string a sentence together? Could I actually communicate? I could understand kind of the gist of what people were saying, but was I, was I able to communicate at all? No. What's poquito? <laughs> I don't know what that means. The nada, exactly. Now here's instead, instead, 90 hours. What percentage of 90 hours, uh, what is percentage is 90 hours of 365 hours? Twenty-five percent. So what if I'd spent just twenty-five percent? So I spent seventy-five percent less time. Just spent twenty-five percent, but I, I invested that forty-five hours a week for two weeks, living in a household that spoke nothing but Spanish. Where would I be at the end of that two weeks, as compared to the three hundred sixty-five hours, one hour a day? Yeah, much farther, much farther. So what am I saying here then? I'm saying. Dudes, we've got this marketing coming out in summer, right? So what should you be doing this this month? We've got this marketing coming out this summer, so what should you be doing this month? You should be seeing any possible client that is going to need any type of servicing. You should be seeing them when? right now so that your three months in the summer are what? 100% completely what? Clear. Because if I'm, at, if I'm talking to you and I say, uh, what did you do? And you say, I didn't have time to do it. Guess what I'm going to ask for, guys? What am I going to ask for? Your calendar, right, Mike? Your calendar, Kevin. <coughs> so if, if don't have to hear, and I've talked about this before, guys. How long does it take a surgeon to become a surgeon? 16 years. 16 years. How much money did they spend becoming a surgeon? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
And if you just give me one month of undivided attention and 15 minutes a day for a year, one month of eight hours a day, one month of eight hours a day, and then just 15 minutes a day, five days a week for a year, you'll be making twice as much as that surgeon. Is that really too much? What will I say to anybody who says that's too much and I don't have time and I'm too busy? What would I say to anybody who said that? So I got one person, two persons who said see ya. Three, come on, I need more. Because here's the thing, guys. I'm happy to put in as much time, as much work, as much effort into you as you are into yourselves. But if you're not willing to put in eight hours a day for a month and you tell me you're too busy to do that, you're too dizzy, busy to do 15 minutes a day, guess what? <coughs> guess who else is too busy to work on your business? Me. Is that fair or is that unfair, guys? Am I being mean? You get that? Good. So clear your calendar over the next month. Clear it by seeing all the people who possibly need your help <laughs> over the next year this month so that you have a full three months ahead of you. Because when we roll out the marketing, that's when we're going to show the, the men from the boys. Because if you, if you don't take advantage of the marketing, guess what you're telling me? If you don't take advantage of the marketing, guess what you're telling me? You're not interested. So over the, then, once you've seen all your clients, what should you be getting great at? Well, the 21 light, you should already be great at that. That's what you should be doing this month. So during the summer, you can be working on the 5Q Masters program, which is learning the full 21 on job training, actually seeing clients doing the full 21, seeing clients doing the full 21. And your summer is going to be better than your first half of the year. So, Missy, where can they find the 5Q Masters Manual? I think you're still muted. Or maybe she's not sorry. there. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm here. Sorry. It's underneath the toolbox, underneath um, getting started, and then the toolbox, and you'll see it as the 5Q Masters Manual. So, guys, these are the things that you should be working on if you really want to change the game this year. And what should you be doing over the next 12 months, guys? What should you be doing over the next 12 months from now, if you have not busting your butt over the next 12 months, 12 months from now, you're going to look back and say, I was a complete blithering what? Idiot. Because now, is, is the business ever going to be more lucrative than it is over the next 12 months? Because I guarantee you, one of the changes DOL is going to make is what? What's going to happen to commissions? They're going to go from 6% to 5, from 5% to 4. What's going to happen to paperwork? So you're going to be doing more paperwork to earn less commission. So what should you be doing over the next 12 months, guys? Making enough money, making enough money so you can hire somebody to do what? Missy, how much of my paperwork did I do when I was in personal production? You didn't do any of that paperwork. Who did all that paperwork for me? I did the paperwork for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and and I paid you well for that. Absolutely. But the fact, that, but you know what? Without you doing the paperwork, how much time would I have had to make the money I made? There was just would no I have ever, would I even come close to making that kind of money? No, not a chance. So guys, make money now so that you can hire somebody to do the paperwork. So that next year, will that slow you down? The extra paperwork will that slow you down? No. Make sense? Okay. So to, the rest of the call I want to talk about is creating an elevator speech and how to use that. So how to create an elevator speech, develop a killer unique marketing message in less than 30 minutes that will bury your competition. Because uh, you, the, what, is, what is the holy grail of marketing, guys? What is the holy grail of marketing? If we could do all, only market one way, how, that's right, you got it, Bert, referrals. Referrals, referrals, referrals. So, you know, because here's the thing, referrals are great, they're free. You're getting an endorsement. If you, and what, your, what should be your closing ratio with referrals, especially with the 21 light? What should be your closing re, uh, uh, 100%? 100%. But here's the thing. It's a great thing, but it doesn't work, just like prohibition. Good idea didn't work because the execution of it. Why, doesn't, why don't referrals work? Here's why. Because your clients love you. Your clients love you. So they go to their friend, neighbor, relative, and say, oh, man, you got to work with Mike. He's an awesome guy. He, he helped us retire. He's got these great ideas. He, he did this income planning for us. Man, it, it's unbelievable. He is the only reason we're able to retire when we're supposed to. Why? You, know, well, you should work with him. What do they say when, when the, uh, 
your client says that? What do, what do their friend, neighbor, or relative say? Yeah, you should work with mine. He did, he did the same thing for me. So then when will my client ever do that again? We don't like rejection. If we don't like rejection, what do you think happens the first time your client does that? Gets rejected. They'll never do it again. They'll never do it again. So then how do we get referrals? Here's why we get referrals. When their friend, neighbor, or relative's advisor quits, retires, dies, or the people move, or their guy makes a mistake, and their friend, neighbor, or relative asks your client, hey, do you know a guy? Then your client will say, yeah, you should work with mine. But they are not going to make the first move. They're going to wait till their friend, neighbor, or relative asks them for a reference. So unless we have some sort of system, unless we have some sort of system that gets um, our clients, friends, neighbors, or relatives to become dissatisfied with their current guide and then ask your client for a reference, guess how well referrals work? So all these books that have been written on referrals, all these thousands of articles that have been written on referrals are all 100% garbage because they're based on the fact that they think they can get the client to go out and ask for referrals. And the client will do that one time and then never again. Am I out to lunch here, guys, or does that make sense? That's why you only get five referrals a year, because your clients only run into five people a year that ask them for a reference. So what we need to do is have a little pithy saying that your clients can share with their, their friends, neighbors, or relatives that gets their friend, neighbor, or relative to say, really? How does, how, how does he do that? So that, not that you're a great guy, not that you did, did blah, 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 blah. They need something that gets a, a, a client, a, a friend, neighbor, or relative to say, really? How did, how, how did he do that? See, because do we like to, what do we feel like when we, when we uh, talk about a restaurant and our friends say, really, where is that? Or we talk about a movie, really? That sounds cool. When we, when we Talk to our friends, neighbors, or relatives, and our friends, neighbors, or relatives look at us being like, wow, you know something I don't know. How does that make us feel? How does that make us feel? makes us feel great. So get, if I feel great, Kevin, then what am I going to do? I'm going to do what? I'm going to do it again and again and again. So when you have something that gets, makes you feel smarter, makes you feel more informed, makes you feel like you've got something somebody else doesn't have, you want to share that with who? The world. And that's what we do with a great elevator speech. Now, we've got to make it easy for our clients to, to do that with their friends, neighbors, relatives. And we also want to make it easy for ourselves, and that's what an elevator speech will do. It'll make it easy for a client to do that and make it easy for yourself to do that. And here's how powerful it can be. For for a hundred years, we had um, was the uh, automobile industry growing or shrinking for a hundred years, from from you know the time of the Model T going forward. Was it shrinking or growing? Well, how about well, okay, it was growing, but how about the number of manufacturers? Was that shrinking or growing? Up to when Hyundai came on the market, it was shrinking. There was one, you know, one, you know, what was it? The the uh, Packard. The I mean, there was one. The Hudson. I mean, they started out with a gazillion car companies, and then one car company fell off after another, after another, after another. And Hyundai and Kia changed that. How did Hyundai and Kia change that? They came up with an unbelievable elevator speech. And the elevator speech was, "We're going to insure your car." for 100,000 miles or 10 years. Now, how much did that beat every other car? It, it wasn't slightly, it wasn't a month more. It wasn't a, a t it was, it blew everybody. It was three times bigger. Three times bigger than any other market and any other um, a company's guarantee out there. So all of a sudden, it got how much attention? Huge attention. And where are they today? There's as many Hondas and Kias on the market uh, on the road as any other car brand, if not more. Now Tesla just did it again recently with the electric car, not only electric car, but an electric car that is cool and awesome and affordable for you know upper middle income and higher people. 
So they did it again. They bust it out, and people are, are signed up in, in bunches to get a Tesla. So if you have it now, if they <laughs> if they came out with a gasoline car that matched the Hyundai and, and Kia, would that have worked? No. Honda and Kia already own that marketplace. They need to come out with another completely different elevator speech, which was, hey, we've got an awesome electric car, and it is cool looking, and it's cool to drive. you got to have something that makes you look what? Oops. Different. you got to stand out. you got to stand out with your elevator speech. So when I say, uh, when, my, when my client says, hey, my guy's a really good income planner, does that stand out, guys? No, I already got a guy who does that. Uh, when they say, um, hey, um, my guy's a really good retirement planner, really good investment planner, does that stand out? No, I already got a guy. My guy does that. You got to have something that they don't, that, that sounds completely different, that they know without even thinking about it, that their guy is not giving them. If you don't have that, your elevator speech is going to be worthless. So let's talk about what does not make unique. I'm a wealth manager. I'm an investment expert. I'm a retirement expert. I'm an income expert. I'm a 401k expert. I give excellent service. I care about my clients. So when you're at a party and somebody says, what do you do? If you say any one of these things, what are people going to do? If you're at a party and you say any one of these things, what are people going to do? They're going to leave because they know you're going to try to sell them something. If your clients <laughs> go to their friends, neighbors, relatives and say any one of these things, what's their friend, neighbor, or relative going to say? Well, I guess that's exactly what my guy does. What are you talking to me about? So you've got to figure out what is unique about you in your target marketplace. Why do they need you? What do you do for them that nobody else does? See, all these things, guess what? Everybody does these things. Every single advisor out there says these things. So you need to figure out what you do for them that nobody else does. Why should they think that you're important? Whether it is true or not, this is the huge one. Whether it is true or not, do they, because people say, well, I really do care more about my clients than other people. So what? Do other advisors say they care about their clients? Yes. So guess what? It doesn't help you. It doesn't help to say that you're, because they, they think, well, yeah, that's what my guy said. And whether their guy did or not, let's say, let me say, what if you say, I really care about my clients, and you really do, and their guy said they really cared about their clients, and then didn't care about the clients, so you do take much better care of your clients than that other, the, the, um, than their guy. Well, guess what? He said the same thing before, once they moved the money, he quit caring about them, so what do they think about you? If he said, I care about my clients, unbelievably, they became his client, and then he stopped caring caring about them, what do they think about you? Oh, you just say the same thing, you're going to do the same thing to me. What if they, he said that they really cares about the clients, and he does care about the clients? Well, then why move? So either way, you saying that you care about your clients is worthless, because either they, they believe the first guy and he didn't care about them, or they believe the first guy and he did care about them. Either way, he's not going to move to you because of that. So you need to do something that is different from your competitors, and, and so, so much so, that, no, that, they, that they know without a doubt, they know without a doubt that, that their guy does not do this thing. Does that make sense? If, if you don't have a unique selling position, uh, uh, proposition, whether it's true or not that they think the competitors do, uh, 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 don't do, then you need to start all over again through this whole process. So you need to look different at a glance. If you want them to look carefully at you to see if you look different, guess what that's worth? If they have to look carefully at you to see that you're different, guess what that's worth? Nothing. Because how many of them are going to look carefully at you? How many people are going to look carefully at you guys? They already got a guy. Why do they need to look at you? So they need to look at a glance and see that you're different. So finish these lines. Nobody does blank like me. Well, that's not going to work. Nobody does retirement like me. Nobody does investments like me. Nobody does uh, income planning like me. What's that worth, guys? Nothing. I'm the best choice among my competitors because I care about my clients. What's that worth? Nothing. None of our competitors know how to benefit our target market by doing or using software like I do. How about, how about this, guys? Tell me if this works. 
None of our competitors know how to benefit our target market by doing or using the 21-point checklist like we do. Does that work? Nope, you're right, John. It does not work. Because do they even know what a 21-point checklist is. No. So that doesn't work. See, the one technique that we know how to use that none of our competitors know is what? Give me one of those things. We know lots of those. Give me one of those things. What's one of the things that we know how to use that our competitors don't know? We use it all the time, guys. You better all be answering this in 15 seconds. I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Good job, Jonathan. Power of attorney. Power of attorney, power of attorney, power of attorney. That's one thing. What's another thing? How about the win, win, win? Trip. Exactly, Mike. The trip. See, we've got all sorts of things that we do that our competitors don't know. See, what you want is when somebody says, what do you do? Or when your client is telling their friend, neighbor, or relative what you do, if that person you're talking to or the person your client is talking to says, how do they do that? What do you have? If they say, how do you do that? If you're at a, at a party and you say, somebody says, what do you do? And you tell them, that's right, you have an audience. You have an open door. You have, you have the ability to now, they're saying, please sell me. Please tell me more. Please explain how, what you do. See, they're, they're, they are now inviting you in. Does that make sense? And when your client says that, how do they do that? It makes the client feel special, smart, like they know something their, their, um, their uh, friend doesn't know. So how do we create an elevator speech that works? Well, number one is you want something that only you claim. Is it something that only you claim? Is it something that none of your competitors are claiming? That's why um, I'm an investment expert or I have a great money manager. Do any of your other competitors say they have great money managers? Does any of your other competitors say, oh, my money manager has this great algorithm that, that keeps the market, uh, you know, on the downside, um, you know, it, on the, when the market's up, it makes almost how much from the market makes it, and the downside is going to protect your downside. How many money managers say that crap? All of them. So that does not work. You can't, hey, I have an investment that when the market goes up, you're going to share in that, and when the market goes down, you lose no money. How many people say that? All of them. So you, it cannot be something <laughs> that everybody else is claiming. And then does it does your elevator speech tap into either frustration, fear, or greed? Fear, frustration, or greed, something that keeps them up at night. Does it tap into something that keeps them up at night? Oh, <laughs> uh, the, here's a, now, this isn't to have to do with the elevator speech, uh, but this, this is a great indication of, um, of uh, hot buttons. Hot buttons are trying to tap into fear, frustration, or greed. So a lot of guys use what? Uh, taxes or uh, fees or blah, blah, blah. Does that keep people up at night? Paying taxes, does that keep them up at night? Not unless they're, uh, you know, the IRS uh, has a, a lien on them. But does paying taxes keep people up at night? No. Does uh, paying too much in fees keep people up at night? No. What does keep people up at night? If their guy is taking advantage of them and they're being disrespected, what's that guy thinking about as he's laying in bed? That guy is disrespecting me. That's a, that's a worm that crawls into their brain can't get away. Now, we can't do that in an elevator speech because we haven't had the chance to do a 21 yet. So to get them to that point, what could we do that would tap into fear, frustration, or greed? Is it extremely specific? This is ex very important. We'll talk about that here in a second. And is it brief? Or and repeatable. Why do you want it brief and repeatable? So your clients can what? Use it. And here's the most important thing. This is tells you whether it's working or not. I don't care if you're doing any of these. If you do these four things, number five should work. If you're not doing any of these things and five is still working, then whatever you have is terrific. If they, after you tell them what, the, uh, they ask you what you do or your client uh, tries to make a referral to you and the person says, how do you do that, means that you have a killer elevator speech. So, will any of these things fit those? No. You got to find something that makes you different. So, first of all, let's talk about things that keep them up at night. Frustration, uh, fear, and greed. Now, unfortunately, like we said, until we do a 21, we're not going to really uh, be able to tap into to, uh, uh, something that's going to really do a fantastic job uh, of this. So, we're going to have to do what we can do. 
Unfortunately, when it comes to greed, that doesn't work anymore because you can't tell people how much money they make. Because as soon as you talk, start talking to people about how much money you can make them, do they believe you? Is anybody going to believe you with how much money you're going to make them? No. And frustration and, fr and frightens, well, um, if you, in the post-trust era, if you try to frighten people too much, guess what they do? Turn you off. So we're going to, I'm going to tell you how we're going to tap into that here in a second. But the, the big thing is you've got to be specific, and here's why. If, if you're looking for a TV set, and, um, and let's say you're looking for a big screen TV set, and one store says, hey, everything on sale all the time. You believe that store. You're going to run right down there and look at that store for your big screen TV? Because how, how specific is that? That's about as general as you can get. Now, what if instead the store, you, you, a store advertises, hey, we've got 10 uh, 55 inch big screen TVs, last year's model, Samsung, model 4959. Uh, we're, we have them on, on sale for 50% off the, the, the cost. Any of the TVs that we have left at four o'clock are going to the boys and going to donate to the Boys and Girls Club. Now, what are you going to do if you're looking for a 55-inch screen TV? You're going to go to that store. Why? Why? Why would you go then? Specific and urgent. See, here's the thing about specificity. If, if let's say that on my teenage son comes home and he's, a, he's an hour late and I say, where were you? Oh, our car broke down. Do I believe that? Do I believe it when he says, my car broke down? No. What if he says, where were you? And he goes, ah, oh, geez, you know, we borrowed um, Jim's dad's Cadillac uh, Escalade and we were down by the uh, Excel Energy Center and uh, the, the car overheated. We had to call Jim's dad. He called the tow truck. At AAA took a half an hour to get there. Do I believe that? See, the more specific you are, the more believable it is. So it has to be extremely specific. With the TV, I thought, could you check out whether uh, Samsung had a model 4959? Could you check out that it was last year's model? Could you check out that it was really half price of what they were charging last year? Could you check out that they actually gave any of the TVs that were left over to the boys. Yes, you could. Most people won't bother checking it out, but the fact that you could check it out if you wanted to makes it what? Believable. But if I say, hey, all things on sale all the time, does that feel like that's something I can check out? Or does it just feel like it's vague and if I tried to nail them down on something, they would just uh, be oily and greasy and, and just come up with some sort of other excuse about why it was. See, vague is not believable. Specific is. Specificity equals trust. This has actually been shown. This sign here, homeless, please help, brings in 15 bucks a day. Need only $10 more to get back home. More specific or less specific, guys? This will bring, this has been, this experiment is done over and over and over. This more specific sign will bring in 10 times more than a vague sign. That's the power of specificity. And it's got to be brief and repeatable so your clients can what? Use it. So what you're looking for is how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? You want them to say that to you or to them. Then you know you have their attention. That's going to get your referrals. It's going to get, uh, and it's going to be when you're, when you're at church at donut hour and somebody says, hey, what do you do anyways? When you're volunteering, says, what do you do anyways? When your new neighbor moves in and says, hey, what do you do anyways? When you're coaching your your uh, uh, kid's baseball team, and the people say, what do you do anyways? It's going to get you people who are interested in what you have to say. See, when you're at a networking event, I'm in the business of understanding customer and buyer needs. It's not going to be anything vague. And, it's going to be, how many people are going to say, really? How do you do that? How do you understand people's customers? And I laugh at all these mission statements of all these companies, and this is what they have. Does anybody say, tell me more about something that's like this? No, can't use it. It's got to be specific. So here's the example I would recommend. What do you do? I get homeowners in Rochester born before 1956 an average of $3,612 in annual government private benefits they weren't aware they were owed using the fullchecklist.com. Am I going to say that all together, guys, like that in a full paragraph? 
Well, let me tell you, I get homeowners in Rochester born before 1956 an average of $3,612 in annual government and private benefits they weren't aware they owed using fullchecklist.com. Is that how I'm going to do it? No. I'll show you how I'm going to do it here in a second. But first thing I'm going to do, let's, let's talk about this. Is this something any of my competitors are talking about? No. Um, is it specific? Let's look at specificity. Homeowners. Rochester. That's two. Born before 1956. Three. 3,612. Four. Government private benefits. Five. Uh, uh, full checklist, six. That is six levels of specificity in one sentence. Now, here's how I would do this. So I'd say, I get homeowners in Rochester born before 1956, um, an average of $3,612 in annual benefits. So if I'm in a homeowner, what am I going to say at that point? If I'm a homeowner, what am I going to say at that point? Well, how do you do that? Or how? Now, so why do I say... Homeowners. Why am I saying homeowners, guys? They have money. That's right. Generally, they're going to have money. Now, do p apartment owners have money? Yes. Do people live in trailer homes have money? Yes. But this is a nice, if, I, if my unique selling proposition, my elevator speech says, uh, for people who have $100,000 or more, blah, blah, what happens immediately to people? They're going to turn you off because you're just after the money. So I say homeowners in Rochester born before 1956. Now, why do I say 1956? Because that's my marketplace, right? People that are between 60 and 75 years old. And then why do I say that? Why don't I say $3,000? Why do I say $3,612? Specificity. Is, is what uh, makes it believable. So I get homeowners in Rochester born before 1956 an average of $3,612 in, in benefits they didn't know they were owed. That's how I'm going to say that. Didn't know they were owed. So remember that fear, frustration, or greed? Here's the thing about, um, about behavioral economics, about psychology. If you tell people, hey, um, do you want 100 bucks? What would, what would, if I walked on the street and said, hey, do you want 100 bucks, how many people would say that they, how many people would put up their hands and say, no, no, get away from me? Because they're, they're thinking, I don't need 100 bucks, and it must come with what? It must come with some sort of uh, attachments. But if somebody's walking out of the store and I say, hey, did that, did the, did the um, clerk give you your $100 uh, uh, voucher or your $100 uh, um, off or your, that hundred dollar bill that they're supposed to give you. How many people are going to go back into the do the store for that? How many people um, see if if you're owed something? I'll give you an example. Let's say that I'm at Costco and I buy a Christmas tree, but I have all sorts of Christmas lights at home. I don't need any Christmas lights, so I buy my tree. I go home and, and I'm fine. But I see my neighbor. He's got the same tree getting off his his car at the same time. I say. Hey, you must have been at Costco. He goes, yeah, I was at Costco. Isn't it awesome? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great tree, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it cool, too? They gave me two boxes that you get two free boxes of lights. What am I thinking? See, they sold me the tree, and did they tell me about the lights? No. Did I want the lights? No. But the fact that they, uh, they, that they, they were supposed to tell me about them and didn't tell me about them makes me what? I didn't need lights. But the guy over there is saying, yeah, isn't that great? And they give you two boxes of free lights. I'm thinking what? That's something that I was what? Owed. And remember, we've been talking a lot about boomers lately. Boomers are the, are, you know, are the greatest generation, the depression generation, the greatest generation that um, uh, Brokaw talks about. They never thought they were owed anything, right? But the boomers, what do they think? What do boomers think? I'm owed everything. So wh what we're doing here, I get homeowners in Rochester born before 1956 an average of $3,612 of benefits that they were owed but aren't getting. See, now what, what happens to the fear, frustration, and greed then? If I said, hey, we, we can find $3,612 of extra stuff for you, guess what most people say? Eh, whatever. 
But you say, if you tell them, we can find $3,612 that you're owed, but you're not getting, is that different or the same? You've all sat down, you've all sat down with people where you've shown them how to reduce their taxes and how to, how to um, get all sorts of things, and at the end, they'll say, ah, oh, that's okay, because they are, they're already living the life they want. They're driving the car they want, going to the restaurants when they want, they're seeing the grandkids when they want, they don't need an extra $3,000. But there's a difference between, hey, we can give you an extra $3,000 and saying, hey, there's $3,000 that you're owed that you're not getting. Do you get that? $3,000 is the same. Behavioral economics shows that, that, that um, if you offer them an extra $3,000, they'll walk away from it. They don't need an extra $3,000 if they're already living the life. But if they're owed $3,000, if they're owed $3,000 and whatever entity it is didn't give it to them, guess what? You now have their what? Different, totally different story. You have their attention. So that's what this is about. So we're going to break this into pieces. We're going to say, well, I get homeowners here in Rochester, born before 1956, an average, and I don't even need to say 1956. If I'm talking to somebody who's my attention in my marketplace, I can just say, I get homeowners here in Rochester, an average of $3,612 in, in uh, benefits that they're owed that they don't even know that they're owed. I now have their what? Attention. Then they're going to say, well, how do you do that? Oh, I have a software called Full Checklist. It actually goes through 21 different touch points and looks at all the different government and private benefits, goes through all sorts of databases to identify the benefits people are owed that they're not getting. Yeah, it's like Expedia. That's what we're doing. It's like Expedia. Does that make sense? So you're breaking this into two different or three different pieces. So this is a, a, a brief conversation, not a paragraph. Does that make sense? It's a brief conversation, not a paragraph. Will it get people that own homes to say, how do you do that? I, I don't know if we'll get everybody. Can we say, how many people, I want everybody to answer this. Will it get at least half the people that you talk to? At least half the people to say, how do you do that? Might not get all of them, but we'll get half. So what you're using right now as an elevator speech is it getting half of the people to say, how do you do that? I'm a wealth manager. that eh, They're done. So, so that's... Uh, oh, and then a lot of people say, well, what benefits are you talking about? What benefits are you talking about? Well, let's go, and we talked about this at a Friday call here a while back. What's the, ben what's the definition of benefit? Something that is advantageous or good. Uh, so do, uh, the 21-point checklist, every single one of those, is that an are they advantageous or good or an advantage? All 21. It, it's, when you think about all the things that we do in the 21-point checklist, is $3,612 uh, a high number, or are we underestimating what we give them? We're way underestimating what we give them. The only reason we don't use it in any, a bigger number is because it become less believable. Because what we give them is way, worth way more than an average of $3,612. So, let's talk about this. Is this something, let's go through the five things it has to, to meet. Is this something anybody else in my t territory is claiming? Does it tap into fear, frustration, or greed? Yes, if you do it the right way. It has to be about you're missing benefits that you're owed. If you're missing benefits in your owed, will that frustrate somebody? Was I frustrated with Costco? Was I afraid that I was missing something that I was owed? Did all of a sudden I become greedy for those, those stupid um, Christmas lights even though I didn't need them? So this is a way to take somebody who's uh, fat, dumb, and happy, somebody who's, who's living the life, somebody who has plenty of money, who's driving the car they want, going on vacation when they want, going, going out to eat when they want. But when they're owed something that they didn't get, those people who are, just, uh, who are totally happy with what they are are going to do what? Well. Yeah, that's right, Kevin. I would drive back to the store and say, give me my lights. Even though I didn't want them, I'd still do that. I'd say, give me my lights. So even though people are happy, would they still, if they're owed it, they would what? So the trick here is owed, 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 that they're owed. How much am I going to emphasize that, they, that they're owed but not getting? How much am I going to emphasize that in this USP? Huge. A lot. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Okay? Is it extremely specific? Yes. Is it brief and repeatable? And then will it get at least half the people to say how do you do that?
So I have a question. I'm a financial, should we start the elevator speech with, I'm a financial advisor and I get homeowners, should you do that? What, let's see what everybody says, should you do that? If I thought you should do that, what would I have done? Everybody's saying no, 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 no. If I thought you should do that, I would have put that in there. Why don't you want to say I'm a financial advisor, I bleh. As soon as you say you're a financial advisor, what happens? That's right, they turn off. They don't want to listen to anything else you have to say. So guys, I, do you think I put some time and effort into this? Does it meet all these things? So how much should you modify this? When will they find out you're a financial advisor? When will they find out I'm a financial advisor extraordinaire? After the 21 mark, exactly. I'm not going to see. <laughs> as soon, when you say, what is it? Anytime somebody hears financial advisor, do they hear advisor or do they hear what? Salesman, that's right. Salesman, 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 salesman. That's what they hear. So there's a reason that my financial advisor is not in there. Does that make sense, John? So let me let me uh, make sure you get a, a yes there from you, John. Perfect. So this is what I'd use again, all in one. I, does this all come out of my mouth at once, or do I fit, uh, uh, let bits and pieces of this come out to get them a uh, uh, little breadcrumbs to get them to say, well, wh what do you mean by that, and how do you do that, and where's this full checklist? And that shouldn't be common, it should be actually org, right? Bits and pieces. So does that help, guys? Now, where should you put this? So it does all those things. And then uh, we talked about this before. The full checklist is a third-party source. It doesn't have your name anywhere on that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing or a bad thing? It's a great thing. Because if your name's on this, and then they go to their advisor and say, do you do a full checklist? And, and your name's on here, guess what their advisor's going to say? Ah, that's just something that, that Mike's doing. You know, it's probably just software that I have. It's just something Mike's doing to blah, 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 blah. But if he goes, if they take it back to their advisor and say, can you do this full checklist? Their advisor's going to say, I don't even know what this is about. I don't, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to... Then the fact that you do it makes you look what? Special. Uh, is the um, elevator speech on the website? Yes, it is. It's under toolbox. No, wait. It's under getting. St Where is it, Missy? <laughs> uh, um, it is under. Um, I think it's under toolbox. But let me go on yeah. checking it here quick. And it's the mini elevator speech. There's a bigger one, but it's the mini elevator speech. And that's the one you want to use. So where should you use this elevator speech? You can use it on your business on your business cards, email signature, and car wrapping. That's a little extreme, <laughs> but uh, you could put use a uh, bumper sticker. Church Bulletin, uh, uh, here's a great thank you gift. Everybody's looking for these reusable grocery bags that you bring, you know, instead of the paper bags or plastic bags. Put it on the back of that. That could be a great thank you gift for people coming on board. Letterhead, basically every communication and marketing piece you use is where you would have that elevator speech. Make sense? And Mike, it is underneath the toolbox, underneath elevator conversation. So getting started, toolbox, elevator conversation, and it's the first one there, the mini elevator speech. So, three things I want you to get out of this call. Number one is if you're <laughs> if you're busy, make yourself unbusy by doing all your client servicing in one month. Number two, make sure you're really diving into the 21 light and 21 uh, uh, checklist so that you can be ready for this summer. And three, here's the elevator speech that you guys should be have at the tip of your tongue, at your fingertips, anywhere you want. Make sense, everybody? So thanks for being on today. Have a great rest of the week, and we will talk to you all on Friday. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you.